be with us today for this very special discussion with my friend David Frum, who is the author of the new book, Trumpocalypse, Restoring American Democracy. Um, this is a successor of sorts to uh, Trumpocracy, which was his bestseller of a few years ago, and it's a tremendous book. I highly commend it to one and all. Um, and David, uh, I was trying to think back when we met uh, so that I could sort of situate this book in your intellectual and political trajectory. And I'm guessing that we would have met about 15 years ago. Um, and at that point, you, had, uh, you were no longer a speechwriter for the George W. Bush administration, and you were at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, and it was a little bit before you were about to start um, your website from Forum. Um, but I had come out not too long before that with the book you have in your hands. Uh, right. which is the this Guardian. is going to help me date this. Because when, 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 we, when I first met you, this was not a new book. Um, uh, it had been out, and, uh, but you had not yet published Rule and, Rule and Ruin. So, so, so this is, I just looked up 2004. Um, but right. uh, and out in paperback in 2006. So that was, so sometime after 2006, because the existence of the paperback was a fact at the time that I, I knew. Okay. And um, actually speaking of Rule and Ruin, uh, some of that book first appeared in public on your website from Ford. Exactly. Yes. And I remember being and very flattered and, you were and encouraged. And while we're log rolling, I'll mention you are thanked in the acknowledgments of this book <laughs> for, your, for reading a much earlier version of it. Indeed. Um, so I found myself wondering, even at the time, then back around 2006, uh, why it was that someone who was or seemed to be at the center of the conservative movement and the Republican Party was interested in the longer history of the Republican Party. And it seemed to me gradually that you were looking for alternatives and yeah. more other stories about the Republican Party and where it had been. Yes. Um, well, I think we both had a similar feeling in those days, which is um, we had come of age in the days when the conservative world and the Republican Party really seemed to offer something important, exciting, hopeful, useful uh, to politics, not just in the United States, but everywhere, um, where uh, the, facing problems of inflation, uh, Soviet imperialism, um, of an economy that seemed to have um, ossified under the burden of regulation, um, and of a country that was losing um, that extraordinary spirit of national unity and identity that had come out of um, the, inter the wars and the Great Depression and the, and the social consensus of the 1950s, it seemed to be splintering um, uh, uh, in the face of, of new challenges to the nation's purpose. And the conservatives seemed to have answers to all of those uh, problems. And so that was very attractive. And the answers were put into place between about 1975 and 1990, and they seemed tremendously successful. Uh, and that, you know, the, the, and I, the sort of the defining moment of our politics was the uh, opening of the Berlin Wall in 1989, which seemed to so magnificently vindicate everything that we'd all been saying, or our, our elders and betters had been saying for, um, for longer than us. But then the project seemed to run out of impetus um, and, uh, and went wrong in various kinds of ways with uh, corruption of various kinds, um, intellectual re you know, reactionary, um, you know, reactionary both in the sense of just backward looking, but also reactionary in the sense of like some of the ugliest elements in, in American life getting a, a, a never more predominant place in the conservative world. And so, and then came the Bush administration where, um, about which there's a lot of positive things to say, but you know, uh, between Iraq and between the economic problems of, uh, that, of the middle 2000s that led to the financial crisis, I think we're all left wondering, you know, um, who, you know, what do we stand for? What are we offering? Who are we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was interesting to, to talk to you back in those days. One of the things I quickly realized was that you are one of Washington's great conveners. Um, there's a witticism that goes around anti-anti-Trump uh, circles that uh, the Never Trump movement is not a political party, it's a dinner party. And I'm sure a lot of those uh, wits have in mind your dinner party specifically. Um, but yes. what was great about uh, being introduced to, to your circle of friends is that a lot of them really don't agree with you on things and are willing to, to push back on you uh, in no uncertain terms. And also a lot of your friends uh, and you yourself also have a great breadth and catholicity of interests, uh, which really does make itself felt in your prose and your analysis. Well, thank you. I don't live in Georgetown, it needs to be said. I'm, I'm a, about a mile and a half, actually a couple of miles north of Georgetown. So it's not a Georgetown cocktail party. Um, and, uh, but that's one of the points of Washington. Um, and one of the ways that Washington is working less and less well is those, you, it, it'll, um, 
the work of politics and ideas is not buffered by personal connection in a way that it was in a previous time. And I, I, that has to, that there are many causes for that. Um, uh, but I would say to the joke, it's a good joke, but it's also true that in the elections of 2018, we discovered that it was not that um, it's not it was not a good description of what was going on. That Never Trump turned out to be a gigantic political movement. It's also the movement that is going to take the Senate from the Republicans, I think, in 2020. That, that Never Trump. It's it's not just the people who come to my dinner table. Never Trump is millions of conservative leaning people, especially women uh, in America's more affluent suburbs who are not on the left. Uh, who do not who do not want to see radical change in America, but who are disgusted by the person of the president and and the cruelty of much of what he not only says and does, but that what he stands for. Yeah, very much so. Um, and you know, one of the things that I felt when I was writing my history of the Republican Party is that the party has at least spoken to the aspirations of the middle class mm -hmm. for most of the party's history, uh, and that no longer really seems to be the case. And that's a large component of why it had lost in 2018 and is likely to lose this year. Well, you know, people have made many way too quick and easy comparisons of the current year with 1968, and they've inserted Donald Trump into the Richard Nixon slot, which is wrong for all kinds of reasons we can go into. But one of the things that's really striking when you see Richard Nixon's television ads from 1968, is that one of the major villains in the ads is the Chicago Police Department under Mayor, da Mayor Daley, who, of course, was a close political ally of Kennedy and Johnson, not of Richard Nixon. And these, these ads are very obviously aimed at people who could more easily imagine their children being clubbed by the Chicago police than serving with the Chicago police. Yeah, no, it's, it's fascinating. And what people tend to forget also is that Richard Nixon's slogan was not us against them. It was not take back America. It was not even make America great again. It was bring us together. Right. Uh, and that's a slogan that's impossible to hear Donald Trump uttering with any kind of credibility. Well, it's something else that people, um, I think, really lose sight of when they compare Trump to Nixon. And aside from the grammar that that was a three-way race and Nixon was the candidate in the middle, uh, not a two-way race. But in 1968, the most salient fact about Richard Nixon was that he had been vice president to Dwight Eisenhower, the great peacemaker, you know, the most, the president presided over the greatest period of social tranquility, um, peace in America's 20th century history. And so, uh, the president who said, I will end the Korean War with honor and did so within six months of, of taking office. So what you thought you were, what you would, if you were a casually interested person, you would have said, Nixon, he's, he was number two to that guy who got us out of Korea and achieved social peace after the turmoil of the 1930s and 40s. Maybe we can have another round of peacemaking at, abroad and social peace at home. Yeah, I know it's true. And again, Richard Nixon's uh, long vice presidency under Dwight Eisenhower would have been foremost in the minds of voters as they elected him in 1968. Right. Not all the trickiness that we know him for right. now. Um, I realized pretty early on after meeting you that uh, one of your great advantages uh, that you had uh, was being married to Danielle Crittenden. Uh, this is yes. an enormous advantage over people who are not married to Danielle Crittenden, which is to say everyone. Um, but she sort of plumbed the the cultural side of politics more than you have, which I think gives her more yeah. of a conservative aspect in most people's minds. But you clearly have both moved away from the conservatism that you once had. Where do you yes. situate yourself now, David? Well, um, uh, we I've been married for a long time and Danielle and I have gone through uh, changes together. Um, I think we have, we, uh, we both naturalized as US citizens about the same time. And so first in Canada, then in the United States, I think we voted the same way in every election except two. Um, in 2008, I voted for McCain and she voted for Obama um, because she said, do you want to tell the grandchildren you voted against the first black president or shall I? Um, uh, but I, I really admired and esteemed McCain and um, for all kinds of reasons, both per personal, even more than political. And um, I, I, I was, I'm, there are many reasons to believe that the, a McCain White House would not have had an orderly staff process um, not probably a rigorous pol pol process of policy development and probably not been the quietest uh, White House ever, but um, he, he was a great man. And uh, it, it, was a, um, it was a good thing to stand with him, especially when you knew he was probably not gonna win. Um, but uh, I think where we, we, um, we, we both have ended up is um, in particular feeling 
one of the things that distinguishes, I think, people as they get older is a feeling that the world's falling apart, that things aren't as good as they used to be. And, um, uh, and you have to stand against change because change must be for the worst. And I, I think we've had a sense together that so many of the changes that we have seen come to the world in our lives have been changes for the better. Um, you know, here in Washington, the decline in the crime, um, and that's true na nationwide. Um, uh, the greater opportunities for people, the improvement of the quality of, of, of life, um, the benefits of material prosperity. Um, and you can just, you say, I, I, it's harder and harder to understand social conservatives who get agitated that the society is going to hell in a handbasket um, because, you know, you're not going to be able to sell corn syrup with a racist cartoon on it anymore. And you're like, I don't know. I mean, first, uh, eliminating corn syrup would itself be a move for the good. But second, uh, if you must have corn syrup, it's not enhanced by the racist cartoon. And it's a good thing that the racist cartoon is finally gone. And it's kind of incredible that it was there as long as it was. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. I, I want to phrase this in a way that gets me into the least amount of trouble. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, when I first met you, your house was uh, a much smaller version of itself, and you've expanded it, and it's a wonderful house now, better than it was before, but it's still identifiably your house. Um, in the same way, you were a good thinker back when I first met you, uh, witty, well-informed, but you could not have written a book on the level of Trumpocalypse. Um, and I, I kind of wonder to what extent it, that's a consequence of your own growth as a thinker as a result of the marginalization from the conservative movement and the Republican Party that you've described. Uh, because I've, of course, always been a devotee of the original generation of neocons who found themselves uh, on, on looking out uh, from outside on the Democratic Party from a place of isolation. Yeah. Well, I, I think we can overdo the um, once, once a darling of the neoconservative establishment, now sleeping on a sewer grate from huddles for warmth. <laughs> um, but um, so two things, I think, that, to that. and. Um, how we change. Uh, one is, I, I remember something that happened when I, I wrote my book on uh, George W. Bush, and um, I showed the first draft to Danielle, and um, she responded, and she doesn't spare her words. She said, uh, she read the first draft, and or the, fine, the draft that I showed her, and said, um, can we afford to give the advance back? And when she was explaining why she thought the book was so terrible, uh, she said, when you, when you write something like this, you need to decide who you're working for. Um, are you working for, are you still working for this White House? Are you working for the reader? And if you're working for the reader, you have to work for the reader. And I think a lot of people in politics, want, uh, it, it, making the commitment, my loyalty is to the person who picked up the book and decided to trust me with their time and money. And I owe them, um, I mean, no one wants a 9,000 page book, so I'm not gonna tell them everything I think, but on whatever the subject of the book is, do not hold back, do not, model, do not worry about yourself, do not think about yourself, think about them and what they need to hear and know. I think that the second thing is, and this is something that, um, look, we're all getting older, and um, I forget whose line it was about age, that uh, imagination, judgment improves, imagination decays. And that I think politics particularly rewards judgment more than it awards rewards imagination and being able to say, you know, um, I've got um, more perspective on the things that are going on in American society and American politics. And um, I'm just not going to, I'm, I, I'm not gonna be frightened by anybody. I mean, at this point, uh, um, and we're all under house arrest anyway, so what more can they do to us? But what can they do to us? I, and I'm always struck when I watch people, um, especially in the Trump world, I think, you know, You're doing this so that your lobbying business will gross X instead of Y, really? I mean, your lobbying business was doing fine. Um, it, it, you know, what are you gonna spend the extra money on anyway? Do you really have to abase yourself in this way? Or um, you know, for, for people like um, the cabinet positions, I mean, if, if you're already Secretary of Defense, I want, you know, if, you're, if you're already Secretary of Defense, Nothing bad can ever happen to you again in this life. You're going to still, you know, you may make more money, you may make less money, you may get a more prestigious appointment, maybe a less one. Uh, but unless you're on crackpot like Michael Flynn, having been Secretary of Defense, you're going to be fine. So why not stand up for the right thing? And if the president fires you, he fires you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's an interesting passage uh, late in your book where you talk about your book from, I believe, 2004, Dead Right, uh, and the endorsements. 1994, excuse me a decade before that. Uh, and the endorsements that you had in those days were from people who have ended up on both sides of the Trump divide now. 
Yes. Uh, There's and, an endorsement you know, on the book, the back of the book from, from Dinesh D'Souza, which uh, uh, I, I look at with some alarm, but there it is. It, it takes one back. Uh, and much as Anne Applebaum has a book coming out about how some of her dearest friends uh, from the early 1990s now cross the street to avoid her and yeah. vice versa, um, one wonders what few future historians will make of this. Why did one person go one way and another person the other way? Yeah, I mean, uh, Anne's book, which I have had a chance to read in Galley and is terrific, um, deals with Poland, uh, Hungary, Britain, and the United States. And, and, and there are very strong family similarities between them. There are also important differences. I mean, and I, I follow Anne's leadership on so many things. The one place where I would dissent a little bit from what she does, her, her view is, I think the Brexit debate is so much more inspiring a debate than the Trump debate. Because, I mean, I, um, I was chairman of a British think tank through the Brexit debate, and we had people on both sides, and um, I, I thought Brexit was a, an unwise idea. Um, but as I said to my British and especially English friends, I can only react to this as a North American. I, I, I can only see it from my point of view. And from a North American point of view, Brexit is obviously a terrible thing. Um, it, pulls, it makes Britain poorer and weaker, and it makes the European Union more protectionist and statist. So, of course, we're cases, but I get, I really do sort of understand why a certain kind of British person, and especially a certain kind of English person, um, would, there was, there, was, there, was, there was kind of, I mean, it didn't make dollars and cents or pounds and pence cents, but there was a kind of, there is a power to the idea of th this country that has always governed itself, um, wanting to govern itself. Um, and this country that has always been, that thought of itself as an island off the shore of Europe, wanting again to be an island off the shore of Europe. And it was not ignoble. Um, it's expensive, but not ignoble. It's very different from what's going on I mean, in um, Poland, Hungary, and, and the United States, where the choice is really between gangsterism and non-gangsterism. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, congratulations on reading, having written this book twice, in effect. Um, I read your, your first draft, as you mentioned, or your earlier draft, uh, and the new book is, is almost completely different, uh, which points to the difficulty of writing about Trump uh, in present time, because you know that at the time your book comes out, there will be some new awful outrage, yeah. uh, some bottom yet to be plumbed. Um, and yet it seems that Trump, the figure, hovered more oppressively over your first draft than this one. Uh, in this yeah. book, you've sort of allowed yourself to envision a future beyond Trump. Am I correct in that? Yeah. Yes. Well, well, first, it is just generally true the way I work, that I am a relentless rewriter and a very radical rewriter. Um, so I, I write and write and write over and throw things out. And um, uh, I'm very wasteful in that way. But um, it's just the way I do things. Um, but when I was started work, I, I thought it was a 50-50 proposition that Donald Trump would be reelected. Um, as I advanced, I became, you know, as of say Thanksgiving of last year, I thought it was a 60-40 proposition that he would not be reelected. Because by the fall of, 20, of 2019, you could see the harm to the American economy being done by the Trump trade wars. And uh, it, be, there are just lots of indicators of trouble, economic trouble and possibly a recession in 2020, even before the pandemic. Um, business and investment had not responded to the Trump tax uh, cuts at all. Um, the trade wars were really big and expensive. Um, the Chinese showed very little interest in coming rapidly to the table and giving Trump an exit from the tra trade wars. And Trump was, um, Trump has a, um, a shrewd instinct that he can't be a war leader, um, that he doesn't just, he does, he will never unite the country. And so he does back, back away from military conflict. But because he's such an obnoxious, person. He, he stumbles toward conflicts and then panics. And he, had, he did that in, in, with Iran in July of 2018. He did it again at Christmas of 2019. And I just thought one of these times he's going to not hit the brakes in time and, and is going to find himself in the conflict that he sort of put the country on the way to. After the arrival of the pandemic, I, I just don't see any way that it isn't a, a disaster for him. Uh, that with unemployment as high as it is, um, with so little prospect of early improvement, um, with the president's own fingerprints. I mean, he's made at every turn, he didn't start the pandemic, of course, but at every turn he made it worse. Um, and, and now uh, what he's done is he started a culture war with himself on the wrong side of it. And one of the great advantages that we all have is that, is that um, 
Trump, well, Trump has this kind of intuitive sense for other people's weakness. Um, he's not terribly realistic about things, about himself or about other, about other people. Um, and he's surrounded by uh, what people who either have no respect for him at all, or who are as crooked as he is, or who are not very smart. And so um, he started this culture war over policing, not able to understand the things that we were talking about at the very beginning. Uh, that a country that has, is experienced right now some of the lowest crime rates in its history as a constitutional republic is not going to react to the slogan law and order in the way that it did during the crack epidemic or during the surge of crime in the 1960s. That um, Americans just, they don't feel afraid of crime and, and, they, and, and if they discover that large numbers of their fellow citizens do fear, uh, feel afraid of the police. And if you can now post video demonstrating and like the first 800 or 900 of those videos, you can say, well, you know, uh, maybe they were edited. Maybe, but, you know, there comes a point where you say, my God, what are these cops doing? Uh, they work for us. They should be more responsible. And, and Trump found himself on the wrong side of a cultural conflict that it, that it was predictable that he would be on the wrong side of because of the declining crime. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this is a moment when the top 10 New York Times bestsellers almost all relate to the black experience, civil rights movement, policing, um, things of that sort, uh, which is not the best time necessarily to come out with a book which is on Trump. And yet your book actually is very timely in anticipating some of this because you do point out in the introduction that when it comes to the pandemic, Trump makes things worse. Um, and we wouldn't necessarily be seeing the same level of united citizen outrage against the murder of George Floyd were it not for the fact that Trump had been stirring this pot so relentlessly for so long. Yeah. Well, look, it's very possible to imagine a different president um, for whom none of this would be directly on point, um, where, uh, you know, like the president of the United States is not responsible for um, the behaviors of local police forces. And the quality of local police forces anyway varies enormously from place to place. So it's pretty easy to imagine a scenario where if somebody, if somebody else were president right now, uh, these demonstrations would be affecting governors and mayors. And the president could lay down some general markers, but largely stay out of the issue. Because you know, when you're mad at the behavior of the Minneapolis police force, it's not the president who hired the chief, staffed the force, made the union contract. Um, these are not presidential matters. And, and a, um, a more self-protective president even might have said, uh, yeah, I, I'm as aghast as anybody. And I, you know, I'm gonna convene a White House conference with the governors and mayors on policing. And, um, but Trump's instinct was to national was to refuse to nationalize the pandemic, which was his job, and to insist on nationalizing uh, the police brutality story, which is largely not his job. Yeah, uh, one of the key themes of your book is that if Trump is defeated, he will have largely defeated himself. Yeah. Um, it would have been very possible for almost any other person occupying that office to say enough of the right, perhaps platitudinous things to get uh, him or her passed. Um, and in the case of obvious national turmoil like this, simply to say the obvious calming things. Uh, and yet Trump seems constitutionally incapable of doing those things that would have led to a fairly easy reelection. Well, pre th this is one of the ways that the world really has changed because of the pandemic. And, um, and uh, I'm sure Bernie Sanders is fulminating about this somewhere, that up to the advent of the pandemic, 2020 was not a change election. There's a lot of data in the book about that, about how satisfied, I mean, if you ask questions like, what do you think of your own finances? Or how do you think the country's doing? Or how do you feel about your own personal health care? Uh, Americans gave the most affirming answers to those questions than they had at any time since the late 1990s. Uh, uh, they just didn't like the president. But uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, when they were campaigning in 2019, vastly misread the appetite of the country for the kind of structural change that they were offering. Uh, Joe Biden got that right. The country wanted some, uh, the country always wants some change. You can always imagine improvements and people want lower co-pays on their health insurance, but they didn't want, they were not looking for anything big. Now the pandemic may have changed that by first making us much poorer and more economically anxious, uh, by, um, by driving home to people the, uh, harms done and the, 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 the risks of having health insurance attached to employment. Uh, when you have high unemployment, people lose their health care. Uh, but uh, it's still true that 
um, you can easily overreact to how much change are Americans exactly demanding. And I, that is something I worry about on the other side and for the politics of the 2020s, that uh, you, could, you can always overdo it. And there, is, and there are movements inside the Democratic Party that are pushing for overdoing it. Yeah, one of the more prescient chapters in your book is called How to Lose to Trump. And it's a warning to the Democratic Party uh, not to overreach, in effect. Um, and that obviously was written before the current events. But you, know, you can see in the Green New Deal, for example, overreach, not in terms of addressing the climate change, which I think most Americans do want and understand there are going to be some sacrifices and even some radical policies involved, but in using climate change as an excuse to bring about the kind of socialization of the economy that they hadn't been able to achieve hitherto. Right. Right. Um, and right now, you know, one can sort of see the seeds of future backlash, perhaps in the 2022 election, being sown by defund the police and other kinds of slogans of that sort. A friend of mine, I, you may have met him, Andrew Coyne, is a very witty Canadian columnist, had, had just one, once wrote this wonderful column on the, what is meant when we say only Nixon can go to China. Um, and there are two ideas there. The first is that the, the public often says is suspicious when a politician advocates something. Is this something you secretly wanted to do all along and were looking for a reason to do and your, your justification is spurious because you really would have don't wanted to do it anyway, or are you really responding to an event? And so when you have a politician who's advocating something that the politician is not crazy about doing in the first place, that carries conviction. Oh, I guess we really have, if Nixon says we have to deal with the Chinese, I guess we have to deal with the Chinese because he sure didn't want it. And, and the second thing is it, it promises limits, which is, if Nixon's, Nixon's going to China, but he's not going to like spend a month there. He's going to spend it and he's going to go to China and do exactly what is necessary and not one bit more. And I think that's the way Americans on an issue like climate, you want to know, okay, you re, this is a real problem. It's not an excuse. And it's not like you gratuitously want to change my life and are going to make me change my life more than is strictly necessary. We're going to do the minimum necessary to solve this problem. And the Green New Deal misses on both those counts. I mean, when you, when you read it, it's one of those documents that, you know, points one, two, three, or whatever it is, they said, yeah, these good, good points here. And then um, we get to the high-speed rail all over the place. Well, I, I, as an Acela rider, I mean, I would like a nicer experience uh, between Washington and New York um, and uh, the trains, the tracks already there. So if we can make it better, but, and then you keep going to, and then we want to make sure that people are guaranteed employment and guaranteed, guaranteed meaningful employment. You think, well, this has got nothing to do. I mean, maybe there's even good things to do, uh, but this has got nothing to do with your stated goal. I, and I, I smell a rat. I think you're seeing this with um, policing and people, they, well, the Americans have proven they want, they want a police force that is respectful of civil rights of everybody. They accept the claim that uh, black Americans face special brutality from the police. We say, okay, now let's defund the police or whatever you meant by that phrase, which, uh, whatever, you know, let's reinvent them in a, in a way where um, we accept threat, damage to property as a price we pay for social justice. Um, I think a lot of Americans say, you're, you're just going too far for us. Yeah, and, and one suspects also that, you know, we probably have arrived at a moment when most people feel the Confederate statues had to come down, just as perhaps Aunt Jemima had to come off the syrup bottle. Um, but there's also with carrying with this, this sense that the whole country's history is one of unrelieved depression. Yeah. And it's, it's impossible to take pride in America's ability for self-correction. And one can see that that has the risk of going too far as well. well I wonder whether it's possible on the statues of monuments is to say, not, these are not all, there are different issues here and they demand different answers. I mean, I remember a, as a kid touring the United States and, um, and hearing from, I, you'd hear Fort Bragg, and I would have enough knowledge of American history. I mean, he was on the other side, like, how did that happen? That's crazy. Uh, I mean, it's weird that you would name uh, army bases for uh, generals who deserted their allegiance to the United States and bore arms against it. So, so the army bases uh, strikes me as a, a no brainer. And, you know, statues to political leaders who, um, uh, broke allegiance. They have Jeff Davis, statue of Jefferson Davis inside the Kentucky legislature. That's, uh, yeah, well, that, why is that there? Uh, that, that's crazy. Um, the monuments to specifically military accomplishment, 
um, that was done by people who were born American citizens and who endured hardship and what that's a different story. Um, the monuments to individual soldiers and the, 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 anonym, the monuments to the anonymous Confederate veterans that you see in many Southern towns, that's a different story again. And then uh, monuments to people who were not Confederates but who were implicated in slavery as the whole country, I mean, there's no one in America who is not implicated in slavery from the founding of the country uh, or the founding of the colonies um, until, and, and it didn't stop in 1865 either. I mean, forever and ever. I mean, th this is part of the national story. We're all implicated in it. Um, and uh, you're, you're not going to be able to visually make that go away. So, um, you know, the Washington Monument, no one's going to knock that down. So once, you, so once, you know, you have to find some place between Fort Bragg and the Washington Monument where you say, oh, Fort Bragg, that obviously makes no sense. He was a dope anyway. Why, why would you name a base for him? Uh, and the Washington Monument, that's obviously saying somewhere in there is the point at which we have to discontinue this. You know, there's, there's a game one can play about the real missed turning points in American history. And one of them also certainly would be the sort of downfall of the radical Republicans and the end of Reconstruction, uh, which hadn't gone far enough and was reversed by, in effect, Confederates bringing in a Jim Crow regime. Um, but the whole idea of that was to bring about a moment of national reconciliation. Uh, and that sentiment carried through for probably much longer than it should have. Um, now, I'm not going to make a direct comparison here, but your book on what should happen within the Republican Party Post-Trump mm -hmm. is called, the chapter is called uh, Against Revenge. Yeah. Um, so maybe the Republican Party is in need of a reconstruction. Maybe it actually needs to, to have whatever passes for the moderate faction oppose the people who are now in charge. Well, that, that I mean, I, the premise of the book is that we are probably moving into an era of, uh, we may be moving into an era of democratic political dominance. That depends on how quickly the economy snaps back from the present downturn. Because if, if there's a sluggish recovery 2022, uh, the Democrats could lose uh, quite a lot of seats. Um, so uh, the, the specifically part, party political chances of the Democratic Party, that depends on the recover, rate of recovery in 21 and 22. But I don't, think, I don't doubt that we're moving to an era of liberal intellectual dominance uh, where conservatives are going to be wrong footed. And it's just going to be not possible for, I mean, too many people are implicated in the Trump proposition. And, and after it's all over and after he loses, and it was obviously a crazy idea to begin with, and after his corruption and crookedness and villainy of all kinds and his incompetence, and with you and I are speaking about just as the first details of the Bolton memoir leaking. I mean, one of the details that, that is in the time story that broke just, just before we started talking was that Mike Pompeo, who's a bigger suck up than Mike Pompeo, uh, passed a note to Bolton at one of their conferences with the Koreans saying something like, what a doofus or what a dope about the president. Um, that, that, you know, that's all going to come out and people are going, to, I mean, it's just going to look ludicrous. And the Fox News evening lineup, they're going to look, I mean, they're going to look like morons even to their fans. Uh, they look like morons to everybody else right now, but to their fans, they're going to look like morons. So that, um, we're going to move into that new era. And, th and then the question, so now how do we, remain a people? How do Americans remain a people through all of this? Uh, because the instinct for conservatism isn't hardwired into the human brain. A third of Americans are broadly sympathetic to, to at least the things Trump said he would do. Um, they have disproportionate political power, and the book has lots of ideas about how to balance that and reduce the ability of those people to do harm. But there's, they're not, even if you have in a completely, even if you had a fairer political system, a third of the country is a third of the country. How, how do you integrate them? And again, without making overly dramatic comparisons, I, I spent a lot of time preparing for this book by reading the history of West Germany in the 15, 20 years after World War II, which is a subject that's poorly, poorly represented in English. But Americans are endlessly fascinated with the Third Reich in World War II. But how did you build a democracy out of the ruins. Um, and that is a much more extreme comparison and not an analogy, it's just suggestive. Uh, but um, it's reminded, even people have, have been really wicked. Uh, you have to, if you're going to redeem them, you have to take them as they are and find a way to lead them to someplace new. Yes, we made allies of people who had been Nazis only a few years earlier. And yeah. even after the war, we're not entirely repentant. I, I saw that there was a poll taken, I think, two years after the end of the war, 
where something like two thirds of Germans still thought that Hitler had good ideas, although yeah. sometimes he may have gone about them in the wrong ways. In fact, the army polled that question at regular intervals, and it's not until the 1960s uh, that, there, that there is a consistent majority of Germans who said that Hitler was a bad idea, not a good idea, badly executed. Um, and it's also true that um, sometime around Christmas of 1945, uh, Germans decided they'd already heard enough about the Holocaust. Uh, that, that, that happened pretty fast. Um, but I, I, I'm, there's a book that had a big impact on me, again, as, as I was preparing for this, written by an American jur uh, journalist who, spent, who spoke German and uh, lived in Germany for a year in 1950-51. And he settled himself in a, in a small town university town where there had been an anti-Semitic outrage and where a court had identified 12 men as the most involved with the anti-Semitic outrage. They burned a synagogue. And he got to know them. He befriended them and to try to understand them and where they were in 1950-51. And with one exception, they were not, I mean, they were, they thought the war was obviously a crazy thing to do. In retrospect, they were totally against <laughs> <laughs> declaring war on the rest of earth. They could see that that had not been a good idea. Um, and, uh, but they were not really remorseful about anything that they themselves had done. And mostly they felt terribly, terribly sorry for themselves. And what is so interesting about the book, it's a, it's a book in dialogue with the present because the author is convinced that these people will remain forever unrepentant and has no idea that the little babies playing around his feet as he's interviewing these people are going to build a model democracy and one that will face its past more honestly and fully than Americans have ever faced their path. And uh, that all the preconditions for this were being put into place even as he so pessimistically wrote about the country that he was visiting in 1950-51. So how should uh, Republicans who have seen Trump as a disaster for their party as well as the country. Deal with the kind of young man you describe toward the end of your book who thinks that yeah. Trump is the greatest thing ever to happen to conservatism and the country. And, and will probably continue to think that that would have been the case had not it been for this radical, unforeseen disaster of a pandemic. Yeah. Well, um, a lot depends on whether the margin of defeat is narrow or big. Um, and if, if the margin of, of defeat is narrow, a lot of Republicans will conclude, and maybe with some justice, I could have gotten away with it, but for these meddlesome pathogens, like, like in Scooby-Doo cartoons. Um, if the margin of defeat is big, then I think there'll be more, we'll have faster and bigger reform. Um, and I think we are going to need, to, I, I think, look, I think the, it's going to be one of the situations where those of us who are on either side of the Trump debate are going to find we have very limited personal possibilities in the future. That those who are very associated with Donald Trump will wear that and um, uh, will be discredited by that for a long time. Um, but those of us who are anti-Trump, I mean, people do not forgive you for being right. Uh, it's worse to be right. I mean, you can, uh, you can forgive people for, having, for being wrong, but you cannot forgive them for being right because that, that, that makes you feel like, well, do they think they're smarter than me? Uh, how, why do they see it when I do? So I think what is going to happen, the path of this is we have, that those of us who have been in this debate have to, if we want to stay involved with the Republican world and Many people in the scan and don't, but I, I do. Uh, um, we have to accept that our role is more going to be as, as guides and communicators than as actual participants and leaders, that the, um, the, the next generation of Republican leadership is forming and it will have to come to term, uh, uh, terms with the Trump experience, uh, partly by banishing it into the past, which is very easy to do. I mean, anyone who is now 22 um, we'll soon think of the period of the late teens as ancient history, and it'll be easy. And just as people came along in the 80s, were able to banish Nixon, were young in the 80s, were able to banish Nixon, that was ancient history. Um, uh, and I, I think we're going to find, as the baby boomers pass from the political stage, that a lot of their cultural agonies are finally, I mean, it is weird that when people would look at uh, the events of 2020 and say, is this like 1968? Because since 1968, God damn it, everything is supposed to be like 19. We're going to, that they are not going to, the people who live through 1968 are not going to shut up about it forever. And they don't smoke and they do take good care of themselves. And modern American medicine is fantastic. Um, and so they're still there all these years later, still, still you know, mad about or proud of the events of 1968. Uh, but uh, that there, there is a statute of limitations on that. And uh, by 2024, it's sure, 68 will surely, 
at last join American history. I mean, imagine we were living through um, the Great Depression and everybody wanted to talk about the William Jennings Bryan campaign and the, uh, the crime of 73. Um, you know, they allowed time to pass and we need to do that too. Yeah, one of the things that I was surprised to see in your book um, was your statistics on the conservatizing of the baby boomers, yeah. um, who really have changed over time from being not very conservative to being almost a majority conservative at that point. But what they're most concerned about is the desire that they keep what they have and that the government not give to those other people. Uh, right. and, and, and that's that's been an interesting development. And this and is this not is just a stereotype. There's, there's lots of survey and data that I quote on this. This is not just, uh, you know, and I'm a baby boomer, by the way, by, uh, technically I was born in, in the Eisenhower administration in the last month. So, you know, these are my people. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not mocking them from a position of superiority, but there's a lot of data on this about how they became very much more conservative after 2008. And when you, but when you ask them, their conservatism is very much self-regarding and lots of data on that. Yeah, they, they want social security and Medicare preserved for themselves. They're not interested they, in funding the schools. They're more likely to say, to oppose, that I, I think I have a data point in the book, that people who were 60 in 19, in 2010, were more likely to oppose any changes, were more likely to say America doesn't do enough for old people than people who were 75. Right, yeah, that's an interesting stat. Um, but presumably they are, will pass from the scene uh, in the next decades. Um, and, well, and yet- even more than that, and this is, this is one of, one of the uh, things that the Republican Party is really, really not ready for. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I had a friend who worked at, um, on the Stephen Harper campaign in uh, the last one, and they spent a lot of money uh, to break out the, to do their polling on over 65s, to break out people who are over um, 75 from people who are under 75, which it turns out to be an expense, I don't know why, but it's an expensive thing to do. And so they usually get aggregated. Because what you discover is the over 75 population is very, very different from the 65 to 75 population. I'm gonna say two things that are, that are kind of obvious when you think about them, they're really important. Over 75, that population becomes much more female. The women outlive the men. And second, it exhausts its private savings. And so when you are looking at people in their 80s, you're looking at a population dominated by women who are heavily dependent on government transfers. Uh, whereas between 65 and 75, it's still mostly, it's nearly 50-50 male-female, and they still have a, a considerable private resources. And so they become, their politics begins to look very, very different, not necessarily in an ideological way. Um, but uh, in Canada, this is one of the things that killed Quebec nationals, is that, that Quebec has had this huge increase in its over 80 population. And that population over 80, who may have once been separatists, now say, I need my check. I'd rather have it from the government of Canada than the government of Quebec. If that check is as much as 36 hours late, that's a calamity for, for me. Um, I want a government that is, has the best possible credit rating, the most reliable uh, delivery of promises. And this is going to come to the United States too. Um, and that the Fox News population is, is going to age into a much more predominantly female population. That's true. Uh, but one of the other n distinctions you notice between older America and younger America is race and diversity. Mm -hmm. And the baby boom generation is largely uh, white and 13% African American. Younger America is much more diverse because of immigration. And this also causes some of the fractures we see in our politics, which leads you to a proposal that even some on the right might not take kindly to, which is that we need to both bolster the social security uh, fabric, the, the social safety net in this country, and also limit immigration. Right. Well, the only answer I can see to the political divides on which demagogues feed, Donald Trump is not, um, people from political conflict is a, is a resource, is to find ways to mitigate political conflict. And, and the way to do that, it seems to me, the only way to do that is by creating a stronger sense of national unity. And I say this not just because, not because I'm so attached to the nation, but it's what we've got. Um, and how do you make nation, national unity stronger? Um, I think you need thicker connections within the national community. And the, the price of having thicker connections is to have a clear distinction between the national community and other national communities. Not because one is superior uh, and others are inferior, not because one, not even to be hostile, but just um, when you say this is something you get for being an American, 
that you have to have both sides of that sentence are equally important. This is something you get, but also for being an American. And if it's something anybody can get, you don't get it for being an American. Um, so I, I think we need to move to a world of, of more generous social provision and more restrictive immigration. That was the world we had in mid-century um, when uh, national unity was stronger, when political consensus was bigger. One of the other changes I'm, I'm big, I've become a big advocate of is we have to break the possibility of voter suppression as a way of winning. And this is something that is very, very Republicans won't accept this as in their immediate self-interest, but it really is. Because right now, we've, uh, Republicans have a narcotic available to them, which is instead of competing for votes, they can try to prevent their opponents from voting. And so that, um, that project, which is ultimately not going to be successful without much more revolution than America can stand, um, that incentivizes Republicans to, you know, um, favor their Tom Cottons and their Josh Hollies. And Josh, those, those two guys, they, they can't win election in the United States. They can only win election if the United, if, if there's someone to make the United States look like Arkansas and Missouri. Um, and when, think of how many people have to not vote to make the United States look like Arkansas and Missouri. Uh, whereas once you accept, you know, uh, California and New York, they're part of America. Uh, they're going to be in the mix. Um, you know, young people are going to vote. Black people are going to vote. Uh, recently naturalized immigrants, they're going to vote. Then you have to say, okay, well, in that case, we have to give up on this Tom Cotton, Josh Hawley adventure um, and find people who represent business, represent private entrepreneurship, property owning, moderate taxation, um, uh, moderately uh, generous but not um, excessive social services, and then compete by in the first place, refraining from insulting the voters we hope to attract. But, you know, the Representative Jim Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin had put forward together uh, a bill to renovate the Voting Rights Act for yeah. the last several Congresses, and he got declining Republican support and co-sponsorship with each Congress. The question is, how realistic is it to expect a Republican Party post-Trump that moves towards a new Voting Rights Act, as well as a carbon tax, a carbon tariff, a legal path to legalization for immigrants, and all the other things that you list as remedies? Um, I don't think Republicans are going to do this. I think these things are going to be done to them, um, and then they're going to um, need to adapt. But um, it's worth remembering, the last reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act was signed by George W. Bush in 2005. And I think Republicans, when, if they listen to what the Supreme Court said in the Shelby County case, that there, there are things there that should be attracting Republicans. I mean, what, what the Roberts Court said was not we're gutting the Voting Rights Act because it's wrong. What it said was the voting, the sections of the Voting Rights Act we're addressing um, are, say that if you, your jurisdiction, state or city, had bad voting behaviors before 1965, you're going to be under a higher level of scrutiny in 2013. And the Roberts Court said that's just irrational. Uh, that, you know, that, that meant, as a practical matter, the state of Hawaii was under special scrutiny and the state of Wisconsin was not. But Wisconsin has been a dreadful actor on voting rights and Hawaii has been a good actor. So uh, you would say, you know, that you're, I think the logical answer is that the Voting Rights Act has to be applied to the whole country. Um, and, and you can't have good states and bad states. It can't be something that the North does to the South because the North is itself um, so often implicated in bad practices. But once you have, and then once you have those rules, um, and I, I propose things like um, a, a national voter ID that the federal government would provide free to everybody. Um, and if there, I, I think it's not crazy. Republicans say you should be able to identify yourself when you vote, good, but uh, it's a practical truth that given the way the ID system works in the United States, that if you require an ID, you're disqualifying people who are going to be pre predominantly poor or, uh, poor and blacker. Make sure everybody has an ID and give it to them for nothing. Why is, why is that something that's on the citizen to provide? The state needs to know who its people are. Uh, is there any reason to believe that uh, a reintroduction of something like the 2013 Republican National Committee autopsy report calling for a Big Tent Republican Party would be better received in 2021 than it was at the time? Uh, Donald Trump seemed to have yeah. overthrown this idea that it's important for the GOP to look to minority groups and try to win them over, but uh, that can't go on forever, one assumes, if demographics continue. Well, th that autopsy gets a lot of romanticization that, um, and you and I were there and remember how it worked. So there were six signatories, and of the six, something like four uh, had very, very close ties to the Jeb Bush campaign. What they were really doing was writing a want ad 
with a particular candidate in mind. And uh, uh, so I, I don't think the autopsy can be done in this top-down way, especially because anyone who would be invited to do it um, is somebody who already, they're going to be tainted by Trumpism, and then they're going to have aspirations of their own for themselves or for their friends. So I think the autopsy has to proceed in a more organic and disputatious way. Um, it's going to be um, a network thing, not a top-down institutional thing. I don't, you can't have that from inside. And then we have to debate what the autopsy is. But there's some things about American life that Republicans need to accept. And I think one of them that you see, have seen in the reaction to the Supreme Court's title, most recent Title VII jurisdiction, which is that one of the big predictions of my book in 1994 was that America was going to cease to be an exception uh, to the rule about modernity translating into secularism and that the power of the religious right was going to fade. Uh, and that uh, what was going to happen was that the that social conservatism would, to put it bluntly, evolve from religious into racial conservatism. And this was a very dangerous tendency. Uh, that's clearly what has happened. Um, but it, it also means that, you know, that the Supreme Court is just by 6-3, read non-discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation into the Civil Rights Act. And something like 90% of Americans think that's a good idea, um, including, I'm sure, a majority of Republicans. Uh, and, and certainly the Republicans who are excited about this have this sense that no one's paying the, the slightest attention. I mean, the, the, this thing that which once would have been dynamite. Um, so we are going to, um, I think uh, other, in other ways, the party is going to internalize the changes that are going to come. And one of the things that is going to internalize is that Donald Trump was um, an unfit president, a scoundrel, um, and uh, that the people who are close to him um, are going to wear that. Hmm. Uh, I was delighted to see in your book that you quoted uh, Rudyard Kipling's poem, Recessional, uh, which was a great foreboding, foretelling yeah. poem about the decline of the British Empire. Um, and uh, one of our questioners raises the point that Republicans have always had a benefit from being perceived as strong or at least competent on national yeah. security. Uh, Trump seems to have lost that benefit. Do you think that will endure? I think we're moving to an era. This this is a pro pro shows the concerns. When I... Um, worked in the Bush administration now 20 years ago. The U.S. economy, depending on how you compute, was somewhere between three and five times bigger than the Chinese economy. Uh, today, depending on how you compute, the United States economy is maybe 20% 20, 20 bigger than the Chinese economy, maybe neck and neck. Uh, but most of us taking part and listening to this call will live to see the China overtake the United States as the largest economy in the world. And then for the first time, since the 1880s, the United States will face a peer power that is an economic equal. Um, and that's going to be a revolution in the way, I mean, in, in the way Americans um, have, to, have to do their foreign policy. And we're going to have to think about national strength. We cannot, the United States is not going to be able to impose its will on China. Uh, it, and we're going to be, we, instead, we're going to find ourselves in a situation where national security politics will be coalition politics, where leadership, American leadership will be leadership by consent of partners who the United States needs as much or more than they need the United States. Uh, David, we're coming near the end of our time, um, and I know you have another appointment to go to. Um, in your book, you're really calling for a kind of pragmatic reform. Um, seems some spirit of that to be shared across both parties if we are to surmount the various crises that you'd identified in your book, as well as the crises that have become apparent uh, in the months since. Do you think that Americans can muster that kind of pragmatism in the end? All those years, many years ago, Daniel Patrick Moynihan and said, you know, the United States is not famous for the world's greatest works of art. Uh, the United States is not famous for the world's greatest cuisine. Uh, the United States uh, is not famous for the douceur of American life. What America, the United States is famous for is solving problems in a reasonable, practical, and expeditious way. That's supposedly the national excellence. Um, and it has to be down there somewhere. And one of the things I say on my talks abroad is, as a Canadian-born person, dual national, I say this to Germans, I say this to British people, the United States you trusted and believed in, it's still there. Uh, and we just have to flake off the rust and dirt and, and we'll find it again. I so much hope you're right, David. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, David Frum's new Thank book you. is Trumpocalypse, Restoring Thanks, American Democracy. Thank you very much to everyone who's joined us today. We appreciate it's you. It's you to the Niskanen Center. Bye-bye. Thank you.